FDN certification course, helping his graduates build their private practices. He's usually found gardening or riding motorcycles. Uh, welcome aboard, Reed. Hey, thanks so much, Dr. Echo. Real pleasure to be here. Great topic today. I know, I'm excited for this one. And I'm also interested in what type of motorcycles would we find you riding? Mostly Harley Davidson. I have a, okay. uh, a Road Glide 2016. I got a couple other bikes, but that's that's my baby. Awesome. That sounds awesome. So I, this one is thyroid imbalances are so, so common in around the globe. And I'm wondering when uh, when are thyroid simple symptoms not a thyroid problem? Well, that could be most of the time, you know, unless it's a um, autoimmune condition, which there is definite pathology in the in the thyroid. But it could be so many other things, Doctor Echo. And um, I mean, just to top off the list, you know, the the thyroid really only does what it's told to by signals from little organs up in your brain, you know, they call the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So these are very sensitive little, little organs up in the brain and they tell the thyroid when it needs to crank up metabolism. And, but sometimes the signals aren't getting there. I mean, those organs, it could be right there. It could, so it could be hypothalamic, it could be pituitary. Um, you could have a problem in the thyroid. Uh, there's such a thing as uh, nutritional deficiencies, but I think they're pretty rare. And I can go on and on. I mean, the thyroid itself uh, doesn't produce active T3, which is usable by the cells. It really produces almost all T4, which has to be converted to T3. Now that happens in the liver for the most part, and maybe that's a problem. So now we've talked about hypothalamic and pituitary and could be uh, nutritional. It could also be in the liver where you're not getting good conversion of T4 to T3. Now, I don't know if you want the whole lesson, but I can tell you that <laughs> that, that conversion is critical. Um, the liver also is re responsible for making thyroid binding globulin so, so that thyroid isn't sucked up by the immediate tissue around it. So in order for thyroid hormone to travel around the body, it gets bound up. And then it goes to the receptor cells in the site, uh, the, the uh, receptor sites in the cells. And by the way, every cell in your body has a thyroid receptor so they're ready for the thyroid so that you can up or down regulate metabolism basically and uh maybe the uh, hormones getting there and maybe it's not and so again the idea of this binding is very very important and uh there's some other ways you can get into the deep end of the weeds on it like the liver also makes reverse t3 and if it makes too much, maybe the reverse T3 is taking up those receptor sites. Now that does happen. And uh, then there's a couple other forms of inactive T3 that have to be activated later, believe it or not, by gut bacteria. Up to 25% of your usable thyroid hormone is made out of T3 acetic acid and T3 sulfate, if you must know. And those, again, they're made in the liver out of T4, but they're not activated until later, again, by gut bacteria. So it's amazing how it's really an orchestration. And in each case, now there's some other examples, other uh, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry that I can give you. But the bottom line is that your symptoms would be the same. So walking into a doctor's office, if you have weight gain or low energy or, you know, you could have tingling hands, feet, uh, dry skin, hair loss, uh, brain fog, constipation, swelling the ankles, feeling blue and sad and things like that. That's a traditionally reliable cluster of symptoms that points the finger at thyroid. But is it thyroid? Well, I just gave you eight ways that it's not the thyroid, but the symptoms, regardless of uh, what the underlying condition is would be the same. So it makes thyroid a very interesting little animal indeed, doesn't it? It, it so, so does. And now let's unpack like your opening piece there, Reed, was like enough for five of our what the health uh, lectures here, which is awesome. 
I want to talk about, so uh, the, the eight different varietals. So when, you know, we see folks, it's like, basically they go into the conventional doc, they get their TSH run thyroid stimulating hormone, and then they're put on Synthroid. Um, so I, you know, you have all of those symptoms that you listed that could be thyroid. It could be some of these other components. I want to talk about some of the other hormones that you look at. What is, what do you recommend for a blood panel for patients to get a thorough evaluation of their thyroid? Um, and then I also want to talk about that peripheral conversion and, and ways that people might be able to tell that they're not getting or they're not utilizing their thyroid well, or maybe it's not their thyroid. So let's start with. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah, start with which one? Oh, yeah. So let's start with um, the blood work and the panel. Let's start with that. What do you recommend for a complete thyroid yeah. look? Yes, yes. You, you know, uh, it, it depends on how the patient is showing up. Um, in real severe cases, when I know that they've got a lot of things going on, they're in a state uh, of what I call metabolic chaos. You'll love this, this construct. You know, it's not a medical diagnosis, but it's my one diagnosis, basically. Metabolic chaos. So things aren't going right. There are just thousands of metabolic processes in the body, and many, many, many of them can be not operating at, at full full force. Now, um, when it comes to the thyroid, if you meet a person who's sicker, quicker, and they might have leaky gut and autoimmune and, and all these different things going on, if they're really miserable, I'd want to do a full panel. I would want to do not only all the thyroid hormones, you would do TSH, you would do T4, T3, probably... Uh, free T3, you'd probably do reverse T3, and you could do a couple others. Um, but I would do the the uh, the autoimmune, the, the, the antibody tests for TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies, because so, that's going to tell you just how much repair work is needed. So that's a full, pretty much a full panel. There's T3 uptake and some others, but um, now you're going to get a more clear picture of is it the thyroid? Or is, or is it more likely to be one of these other influencers? And uh, so you could start there. And by the way, uh, you know, conventional medicine, which I don't practice medicine, uh, uh, everything we do is what, what's called evidence-based, functional, functional health coaching. Um, you know, we're always looking upstream. That's why I know about that anatomy that we went through a very short a litany on but um but so you do have to look upstream but look there's nothing wrong if you have that cluster of symptoms i'm talking about uh then you probably should just get a standard panel and see now because uh, a physician can give you something to relieve your symptoms and that we call that relief care i certainly wouldn't want to leave it there uh, that's not your landing place. That's your jumping off point. You know, so you could do a standard panel. Oh, yeah, look, you're hypothyroid. Doesn't mean anything's wrong with your thyroid, as I explained, but it means you are low, low in production, lower than normal. So you would have some of the metabolic issues, um, you know, the tiredness, the fatigue, the sad, feeling blue, the, the various symptoms. And if you took the medication, not sure I like T4 or Synthroid very much because it's artificial. You know, it's a synthetic T4. It still has to get converted to T3. Why not just take the T3 active? You know, you can get all kinds of natural products. But but it's okay to get diagnosed hypothyroid and treated and get some symptom relief. You'll feel better. Now, as to whether you fixed anything, that remains a big question. And I, in most cases doubt it you know if you're not looking upstream right doc i mean you agree yeah. with that yeah oh yeah that is it's such a i mean i think it's a, a big play to really look at um the anti the the antibodies for sure um i find most folks have hashimoto's thyroiditis mm -hmm. that we will take a whole different approach because it's an immune system issue, not just thyroid issue. Uh, but conventionally, they just kind of be put on Synthroid T4, which is, as you mentioned, the inactive form of thyroid. 
And, and it a lot of times doesn't alleviate the symptoms. Like I'm with you, you know, my moniker is where East meets West naturally. And so um, I want to do what's <laughs> best for the individual in front of me. And, you yeah. know, if a lot of folks will just come in on synthetic thyroid and, but it just long-term, it just doesn't seem to do the trick. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show um, and talk on this functional sure. approach uh, because you're training people around the globe, which is awesome on, you know, proper labs, how to interpret and, um, you know, on creating a, a wellness program for folks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a very holistic we end up with a holistic grounding program. Go, go on. You were going to ask. Oh, well, I was going to ask. So on um, when you're looking at that, you know, there's a couple of different components, right? With, you know, the way that I, I'll talk about just a simplistic endocrine triangle between the thyroid, uh, the sex hormone, so estrogen, progesterone, or testosterone and or, and the cortisol, adrenal glands, those three glands. Now you threw in, um, a whole a bunch of other nuances on top of that, right? Um, so other areas, like what do you see are the major trends for folks with thyroid? Well, you're hitting on a bunch of them. Now, um, in terms of that triad you talked about, uh, you mentioned the gonads, you know, where the sex hormones are produced, uh, the adrenals, where the stress hormones are produced, and the thyroid, which is where your metabolic hormone is produced for the most part. So those three represent a very interesting triad. And they all kind of feed off each other or disrupt each other. You know, the adrenals being maybe, uh, you know, one of the most immediate, effect, you know, handlers of stress. So if stress is, uh, well, and let me put it in, this in context too, because I mentioned that the hypothalamus pituitary regulate the thyroid. They also regulate the gonads. They also regulate the adrenals. So you've got this, this triad has kind of the same masters up here in the brain, little tiny, very sensitive organs. So they're intimately connected. The, the adrenals, the gonads, the thyroid, they all get kind of the blame for a lot of things. Like we just went over a list of symptoms with thyroid. You can go over a list of symptoms with uh, the sex hormones low libido and breast tenderness and weird periods, you know, and just, you just so many different things. Um, and then with the adrenals, you get a lot of the, the fatigue and foggy thinking and you need coffee and you, you know, you, you're sensitive to sunlight and you just, so you, you could have all these things going on and um, you've got to be able to have a construct. I, I just call it metabolic chaos. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's, that's a good construct. People can understand there's so many different influences and downstream these, these organs are um, maybe not getting the right signals. Uh, they could be overproducing, underproducing and the other organs and systems involved, the metabolic processes, they're part of it too. Like I mentioned, the liver is so important to uh, convert T4 to T3 and, and so on and so on. So you've really got quite an orchestration going on in the body and and you ought to have some way of just starting with one thing that you know and building on it and building on it and building on it. Um, so we run labs and we get data on the thyroid hormones, the adrenal hormones, the sex hormones. And then we compare them to a person. And does it explain anything? Do these levels explain anything? Personally, I don't want to just treat the paper. You know, we mentioned, oh, low thyroid, here's here's your medicine, you know, they give you something, oh, that'll take care of it. Well, not really. It's just going to take care of the some of the symptoms some of the time. I'm glad you brought up that a lot of people just don't feel that much better on that medication. It's because, And that's a first sign. That's the first clue that there's lots else going on. There's lots of other sort of metabolic chaos. Now, I, I want to throw in here that there's some good news really good news and that is that um upstream as we're looking for the underlying causes and conditions and often you hear it referred to as the root cause well mm -hmm. in 20 years of me looking for the root cause i haven't found it in a lot of cases but i've gotten close enough to it doc to have an effect upon it 
So there's no one test you could run for all these things. And I could run 10 tests on someone and still not find that elusive root cause. But it doesn't deter me. I'm looking as, for, for as many healing opportunities as possible. And then I'm going to apply the general principles of health building. What does it take to have a beneficial effect, a good effect on every cell, every tissue, every organ, every system? So in that way, we're just building health. We're not treating one little thing. Yeah. So what you, you mentioned, you know, why, why most doctors call hypothyroidism idiopathic, quote unquote, <laughs> uh, and why it's not. So, I mean, you're kind of answering it now, but I want that explicitly from you. Yes. Well, if, if, if you know, if you have a thyroid condition, you're listening to this, have you ever asked the doctor why? Like if yeah. you're on Synthroid, yeah. do you ever say, well, what's wrong with my thyroid? Uh, the word idiopathic is what they use, but it equates to a shrug of the shoulders. Yeah. It just goes, that's what idiopathic means. Like, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, we look, we, you know, like you got to at least give it a shot, you know, like, look, you may not find the exact reason. You remember I said it could be hypothalamic or pituitary, these little signals from the base of the brain that are, they're reading, they're like a thermostat for the, uh, sex hormones for the adrenal hormones, especially your adrenaline and cortisol and things, and for thyroid hormones too. And when they they just know when the time is right to put out some signal to the thyroid or adrenals, make more hormones. And uh, but those glands themselves are under stress; they're under the influence of uh, toxins and chemicals and neurotransmitters and even the daylight cycle, the circadian rhythm and the autonomic nervous system. If you're overly sympathetic dominant, if you're in fight flight all the time, well, then those little control organs get, uh, bad signals too, in a sense. And they're going to, not going to put out exactly the right signals to these other very helpful organs, that, you know, that are downstream and there's things downstream in them. So, so that's, again, why I use this term, uh, metabolic chaos. That's saying something. That's at least a construct. It's a lot better than a shrug of the shoulders. Indeed. Because I, I like because, that. I'm going to take that. Yeah. I'm going to take that moniker on, that metabolic chaos. I like, I like that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. on, um, so how does stress, so we talked about kind of the endocrine triangle that I talk about it, but how does stress yeah. affect thyroid function? Um, yeah. Well, cortisol is the stress hormone, basically, and it's um, the helper for adrenaline. So when you get cut off in traffic or in a fight or yelled at or whatever, you know, your, your, your adrenaline kicks in to give you more power, more strength. There's other physiological aspects that make you able to run or stand and fight uh, at a higher level. And cortisol kicks in right behind it to enhance the effects of the flight flight mechanism, the, uh, adrenaline, we call it norepinephrine now, but it's adrenaline. And, um, and so now you've got, uh, it controls your blood sugar, it raises blood sugar, uh, it'll increase your heart rate, blood pressure will go, up. you know, again, you're enhancing the ability to run away or stand and fight this fight flight thing. And so what we also notice is that while cortisol might be helpful in that way, if it's a short period of time, um, by the way, cortisol is an anti-inflammatory and a painkiller. So it actually helps you if you get punched in the face, you're not going to feel it. With adrenaline plus cortisol, you can stand and fight. And, uh, you know, it even uh, reduces the amount of blood you have in your peripheral uh, body parts so that you wouldn't bleed as much. You know, it's really uh, well thought out if you think, you know, there is an intelligence in there somewhere, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and so so there's all this intelligence uh, going on. And let me ask you a question or ask the audience to think about this for a minute. Remember, the thyroid is responsible for metabolism. Well, if you're under fight flight, would you want that to be at a high rate or at a low rate? And if you can't figure it out, you'd probably want it to slow down a little bit. Why? To conserve resources. And so there's actually a direct connection between, uh, it's called um, CRH or, uh, and the, uh, it's, no, I'm sorry, it's TRH, the thyroid uh, 
stimulating hormone, TSH. So cortisol will suppress TSH from the pituitary. So, you know, you're actually slowing down the thyroid on purpose. If you're under chronic stress, well, it'd be natural to go into a little bit of hibernation and save resources and, and hold on to that energy that might be stored in your fat and, and uh, organs in the form of, you know, glucose or glycogen or something like that. So, so there's a lot of physiology going on. So that's and, a component um, it's with totally weight, natural, right? That's a part of the weight gain that we see or the inability to lose the weight with uh, when people are under stress and thyroid. they're hypothyroid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the body's going to store energy if it can. And so this is why if you just think of your ancient ancestors, wherever they might be, um, you know, they when, when hunting season was good in the spring and, and, and summer, maybe, you know, they were uh, capturing a lot of game and, uh, you know, storing the meat and jerky and pemmican and all these different things. But they also were storing and eating a lot of the uh, carbohydrates that would be more available in the summertime, putting on fat. They'd actually gain weight in the in the summer and fall as they were harvesting and and packing it on. Why? Because in the winter time it's going to be lean. There's nothing growing. If you didn't store some some vegetation, you know some berries or fruits or vegetables or something, you probably weren't going to have any in the winter time. Uh, depending on where your ancestors grew up, you know, or, or were evolved from, or whatever you want to call it, sure. um, and so there's sure. a natural consequences to uh, being under stress and um, having food available 365 days, 24 hours a day. You know, that's gonna have its uh, moments with you. It's it gonna is. have its way with you if you don't be disciplined yourself. It really is. And I think, you know, we see that playing out with people's health um, with just the continual access of 24 hour snacking and not getting any gut relief. Before we get into that gut discussion, though, I want to talk about that. I'm wondering in your practice or in, in the coaches that you have set up, are you seeing a greater trend towards uh, the Hashimoto's or the autoimmune component of thyroid, because you said that is in your complete workup and panel, you do recommend everybody get that evaluated. And, and if so, if you do, great. Uh, if not, that's okay, too. And then wondering, you know, that immune system function, how that influences the thyroid. Well, sure, I think it, it probably influences it more um, indirectly, because the hypothalamus pituitary, remember the major uh, control mechanisms, the thermostat, if you will, um, is they're just little teeny things. And they're very sensitive, um, of course, to the immune system. And I mentioned toxicity and uh, other hormones and the circadian rhythm and the sympathetic dominance, you know, being in that fight flight. And um, so it's just one of many things. I, I I would tell you this, I don't focus that much on thyroid in the initial stages. Um, we'd be looking more at the adrenals and the sex hormones. We look at digestion, detoxification, and the immune system, of course. And because the, the thyroid seems to tag along, whichever way, whatever behavior you um, have or, or do, um, the, the thyroid's going to go along with you. If you can reduce stress, and of course, you know, eat right and sleep right and exercise right and, and, and reduce that stress. Like said, the thyroid w might flatten out. It might might let just level right out, return to where it's supposed to be. It might take a while um, and it could take some nurturing as well. There's foods that would help, you know, always, I mean, pretty much never eat, you know, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides, you know, all these things we have um, that make it interesting. But um, you know, there, so there's, there's just a way to live out of the trouble that living got you into. And I would just put it as simple as that. I, I don't know that I've expressed it exactly that way before, but <laughs> if you lived yourself into that problem from bad habit, you can really take a stab at, especially with some coaching and some lab, some good lab results. Uh, to work with, you know, as starting points and things, you can guide yourself right out of that if you're willing, if you're motivated. Well, so it kind committed. of 
Yeah, for sure. So, so cycling back into the immune connection, though, um, and how the immune system affects the thyroid and make the symptoms worse. Um, are you seeing a trend more towards the autoimmune component? I, I mean, you kind of answered yes. thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just in general terms. But I'd say we're seeing plenty of it. I mean, I, th I think regular, regular hypothyroidism is still more common because it's just natural, a natural phenomenon. The body's just slowing down metabolism because uh, of the amount of chronic stress you're under. But when you start throwing the immune system into it, it gets worse, especially if you have what they call hyperpermeability or, or leaky gut. Then you've got um, unwanted immune complexes and antigens float around the body and the body can start attacking itself. You know, it's trying to put out the fires here and there with this leaky gut, but it, it will start targeting other tissue. Uh, that's your immune system creating a lot of inflammation and then the dysfunction and downward spiral can be pretty devastating. So um, again, that's why in the very beginning, when you asked me, I don't run the, the thyroid antibodies immediately, you know, I got, unless they have, it depends how they show up. Okay. Um, and you'd be surprised how much of that you identify, you know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, plenty of that. Yeah. And, you know, it's been, I mean, and it could be, you know, my, my skewed um, practice because at nature cures folks are, have seen a bunch of practitioners. And I like to say that you don't want to be the interesting patient in my practice. So I, I might just be seeing more folks with the autoimmune aspect of the thyroid um, just because, yeah. you know, it is a different way or different approach when it's the immune system function driving it. Um, mostly, again, conventionally, people are just put on thyroid medications, even when it's an autoimmune condition. Um, yes, they need yeah. that support, but we also have to work at balancing out the immune system. Um, so looking at, um, you know, uh, it was a fascinating component. I want to really highlight how what you said was every cell of the body has thyroid receptors on it. And looking at it as this metabolic chaos and having really stress components and stressors of toxicity, which we're going to talk about here in a moment, um, coming into play of slowing down our metabolism, making our thyroid hypo or less active. Um, how, do you, how do you educate or coach folks um, around that aspect of it, of looking at it like, is there a way for people to measure their peripheral conversion of thyroid or, you know, a lot of times it's just missed by running the simple panels, right? It can be missed, uh, but that's kind of where your clinical skills come in and, and we call it clinical correlation, like really, really knowing how to size people up. Um, the, the impression forming is uh, what skill I think that the best doctors or, or even health coaches um, can develop, you know, is correlating these things. And you have to be a good history taker. You got to be able to listen really well and look for clues. You have to be a health detective. Now you've got the lab work to back you up, but you know, e even there, some of the underlying causes can be so far removed from the symptoms that are being exhibited. And thyroid is an example I use in my training all the time. People with that cluster of symptoms we talked about, well, it sounds like thyroid. Mm -hmm. And so doctors then would run a thyroid test and pat themselves in the back. Oh, I found your problem, your hypothyroid. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, and write the prescription, right? And oh my God, well, if, you, if symptoms abate a little bit, you know, you, you go, oh, thank you. Yeah, I feel a little bit better, you know, but I still have this some other complaint, you know, so they then again, the physician who's not the best impression former isn't really looking for the clues. He's just trying to find the shortest way to get you out of pain or discomfort. Well, let's say um, now that you're on thyroid medication and you're, you know, you don't have the cold extremities, you're constipation, you don't feel so sad. Um, you might even lose a pound or two, but you have no libido, your energy still sucks. And, oh, well, that sounds like maybe it's testosterone. So there's an, oh, so now, and then 
Run a test for testosterone. Pat yourself on the back again. Oh, I found your your other problem. It's low testosterone. And here's the prescription for that now. So you really just have a cycle of um, complaints, sounds like, and you then run a test and treat the immediate um, supposed causal factor, like low testosterone. But is there really anything wrong with your gonads or, you know, in women, their testosterone is made a lot in the adrenal glands, actually. And so, and they need it. Um, and so, you know, are you really going upstream enough using that system of sounds like, which means you're guessing at what tests to run, and God forbid you're lucky and, and think you did something, you know, because um, you, you can, again, you can get people from one visit to the next that way and kind of address each concern that way. But they're not getting healthier. As a matter of fact, they're probably getting more and more unhealthy because whatever is driving those downward spirals isn't being addressed. Yeah. You're not addressing their environment, their lifestyle, their point of view, their uh, or anything else that that is really the the real answer to it. Reed, do so you I'm ever, not sure I answered your question. You ever, but yeah, sure. Do you ever use like a temperature log or following folks' temperatures on um, to see if they're actually using their thyroid, or is that something that you've seen to be of value? You know, I don't I don't um, monitor drug usage. You know, I, I help people um, in cooperation with their physicians try to get off medication and use, uh, first of all, more natural agents, but then again, restore the function of the organs. So that's really, it takes time. But I know people who do and do use that, of course. Yeah, and I'm very well aware of, of how it's done. And, you know, I mean, we, as a screening in the office, we used to just have people take their temperature and, you know, people with low thyroid, it tends to run cooler. And so, oh yeah, that would just be a self-screening that then we could, you know, then recommend they get the test, you know, like, well, now we're we sure. well just test. You know, um, one, yeah. one way that I've really uh, measured it is I have people take their temperature three hours after they wake up, three hours after that, and three hours after that. So they do that for three days and they average their temperature on the day. Um, I use that to see because their labs could be, you know, within normal limits or the reference range, right? Because we know there's no normal on the lab work. Um, but yeah. we can really see if they're really utilizing and peripherally converting their thyroid from T4 to T3 by having a 98.6 plus or minus 0.4 degrees. So 98.2 to 99. Uh, and if they're not in that range, you know, oftentimes I'll see folks, they say, oh, my provider says, you know, I just have a low body temperature. Um, what <laughs> is the, what, what have you found to be the problem with having a low body temperature, right? I mean, there's so many enzymes that aren't working in our bodies at that level. And you're telling us every cell of our body has a thyroid receptor, right? So that is, I yeah, everybody, every, yes. so, so that might point the finger at low thyroid but the question is still what do you do about it you know so now you know they have low thyroid and they're not converting um good uh and and then you know are you gonna what are you gonna do about it so um we we have a lifestyle program it's a it's an epigenetic holistic behavior protocol where you eat according to your type your your right type now cells produce energy this is part of the temperature thing too, and use the thyroid hormone. So cells have to be fueled perfectly uh, with the right fuel mixture. And there's a perfect mixture for you. It's not gonna be the exact same as mine. We might generally both be uh, protein types, but there's gonna be somewhere on the dial that you land and I land that are a little bit differently. Um, kind of like dialing in the old radio stations in your car. If you remember that far back, you'd have to turn the knob until it sounded really good. And then you'd always go past it to double check. And then you'd back, you know, you'd, you'd go, you know, and back a little bit. Oh, yeah. That's dialing it in, the expression dial it in. So you can dial in your protein, fat, and carb ratios to get that cell firing on all cylinders. And the, the, the thyroid receptorship would be a part of, of why that's working really good for you or not. It's mostly has to do with the oxidative rate, the rate at which you're actually burning fuel.
You just want the right mixture. And if you give a protein type the wrong mixture, they really do badly. You know, they get really unhealthy. They have no energy. They overeat. They get uh, overweight. They, they uh, get insulin resistance and um, triglycerides and cholesterol and, and all these different things. So anyway, so I think that's as important as anything. Thyroid, to me, just seems to, you know, be a part of the puzzle um, that can be corrected more or less the same way with, with, by fueling the cells. Now this, because remember, you, you, I mean, you, we talk about thyroid here. Um, those thyroid receptors could be uh, really sort of clogged up with the reverse T3, or they might be burnt out. You know, receptorship is not a given. It's like, well, if you have had too much thyroid, there is hyper hyperthyroid, um, especially from poor uh, binding of the thyroid hormone. Remember, the liver's involved. You want to bind that thyroid up, but not overbind it. And so if you have underbinding because of a liver dysfunction, then you can burn out the receptor sites. And then within the cell itself, you can have transcription uh, problems, you know, and it's just not using the thyroid, even if it's getting there, even if the receptor site uh, is working. Um, there's other things that can happen on a cellular level. And... Um, I'm not sure we need to go that deep. No, but, it is but really, I want you to really speak interesting. Into, yeah, speak into the liver connection a little bit more on what's happening there. Um, so what are you seeing that that aspect of the? Yeah. Well, what I what you see in the big picture is that the liver is really important, and you got to take care of your detoxification organs because they don't just detoxify; they process um, other elements in the body like thyroid hormone they help convert t4 to t3 it happens in the liver for the most part so the thyroid makes this um t4 it's in the liver it's being converted through enzymes and minerals cofactors into t3 basically you're taking away one of the um tyrosine uh molecules right t3 uh and t4 one of the uh so you have iodine and you have tyrosine and that's what it's made out of. So you're removing one molecule and then it's going out there and it can do its job. But the liver is also making reverse T3 just as kind of a balancer. It just, just sort of knows how to do that. It also makes, as I said, T3 acetate and, or acetic acid and T3 sulfate. I don't know why. It just does. And those are later converted to t active T3 to be used by the cells. They're converted by gut uh, bacteria. So it's, it's just remarkable orchestration. Again, there's this intelligence that's beyond me, and, and, but I know it's there and I, I get glimpses into the, and insights into um, how it's supposed to be. You know? so it, but in the long run, all I can do is guide people's behavior uh, to nurture all the functions of the body heart, lungs, pancreas, kidneys, adrenals, ovaries, testes, if you got them, nurture function in the body, coach up function with, with the right foods for the uh, metabolic type, we call it, um, with the right rest, with exercise, and, and coach down the contributors to metabolic chaos, the toxins and the chemicals and the, um, and the mental emotional abuse and the physical aches and pains and injuries. There's a lot to coach down a lot of it's hidden. Well, let's and talk about the levels of toxicity then. Um, so how, how is that involved with hypothyroidism? Well, there's always direct effects. And then there's the uh, sort of uh, peripheral effects, like with the, I mean, all of your organs are sensitive to toxins. And some of these toxins are actually made in the body. Some of them came up, come off of bacteria. Uh, some of them, um, come from the environment, the, the external, and they're just, they're ubiquitous. Interestingly, I think uh, back in the 90s, I was an environmental paralegal. I was saving the planet, air, birds, water, trees, bees. And I noticed things dying a lot. And uh, I made really good money in the environment cleanup business. But I started turning my attention to, well, what's it doing to people? If it's this bad for animals and plants, what's it doing to us, including me? 
So I made a decision then to start studying that part of it. And I went to work running a, a wellness center and uh, just had some amazing opportunities there to make some observations and, and kind of came up with this whole large, big picture scheme. And he, believe me, because of my background in the environment and what I've learned since, toxins are ubiquitously and uh, dangerous and uh, destructive. And you're breathing them in. I've had one physician friend of mine, really smart guy, Dr. Russell Jaffe. He owns a lab. He owns a supplement company. Brilliant guy goes around. You may have uh, seen him because he provides uh, continuing education credits for doctors. You can go listen to him and get your relicensing credits. So he, um, he says we're marinating in a toxic soup. <laughs> now, he might be in a, be in a little bit dramatic, but, but according yeah. to some people's bodies and what it does, because remember, we're, we're all born with these weak links in metabolism, like like I'm a pretty robust guy. I've got a lot of longevity in my in my family, and I just seem to be able to stand up and take a beating. You know, like I've been really hard on my body. It's very well used, in case you can't tell. <laughs> and um, and you know, so I put it through hell, and I and I survive. Other people are subject to the same things. Not so lucky, you know. Or th this, th there's again, there's these. Um, Errors in metabolism, weak links in metabolism, what you might call vital voids. And some people just get whacked. They're sicker quicker and, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, we are, I would say we're swimming in the toxins and uh, marinating. I guess if you're a chef, that makes sense. We are marinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's a chef, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, you know, and it is, um, you know, it does slow down our metabolism. I think this concept that I, I keep coming back to and I want to keep exploring with you around, you know, all of the cells having thyroid receptors, that seems to really stick out in our conversation here for the folks that are suffering with hypothyroidism, but for everyone else as well. Um, it's not that all of the cells have receptors for all of the other hormones, right? That's correct. Only, only some cells have, uh, let's say testosterone receptors, you know, and it, yeah. where it can have its effect, but thyroid's a different kind of hormone, you know, yeah. uh, cortisol is way up there among the number of receptor, uh, sites. Cause it has an effect. It can break your body down cortisol. Um, its job is basically to raise blood sugar. You need energy and you get it mostly from sugar, especially the brain. It burns through sugar like crazy. Mm. So um, if you're under stress, cortisol kicks in, raises blood sugar. It's why you wake up at night. If you're from, it's from the cortisol, uh, but it might be kicking in because of either low cortisol or from uh, low blood sugar. Your blood sugar drops, your cortisol is kicking in to raise it. Yeah. And you, you do this thing called... Uh, gluconeogenesis it'll it'll extract or help extract blood or sugar from anywhere including breaking down your muscle if you look at runners mm. who do the marathons and stuff and they all look kind of emaciated and older than they really are and it's because yeah. of cortisol i think um at least that's a piece of the puzzle you're not breaking their body runners. down <laughs> no i think i think i i think running's fantastic i think running 26 miles is more than I care to bite off and chew. Yeah, I'm <laughs> with you. So speaking, yeah. speaking of biting off and chewing, so let's talk about that gut and digestive issues uh, with lower thyroid function and, and that connection, because you said a bunch of our probiotics are actually making the thyroid in the bowel. Um, so speak into that c connection for us. Well, you know, we I mentioned that um, part of your thyroid kind of hovers or is stored as um, a different form of active T3, the acetic acid and the T3 sulfate. So they're just there waiting for the right time. You know, the body knows what's going on and it will convert that into active um, T3. That's up to 25% of your hormones, your active T3 hormone. Can you imagine that? So you'd be walking around hypothyroid and there's nothing wrong with your thyroid. There's nothing wrong with the hypothalamus pituitary that's sending the signals to the thyroid. It's just that you're missing three quarters of your thyroid because of you don't have the proper conversion of these sort of subtypes of, of T3. 
uh, I find that fascinating. Why you want to keep your gut healthy? So look, we've talked about keeping your brain healthy and being stress free, and keeping your liver healthy, and you know that also detoxifies your body, by the way. And now we're keeping the gut healthy, which is where you break down, digest, and absorb food. You know, and not to mention it being 80% of your immune system. So I don't see anything that's not connected to everything else. And I, I like talking about, you know, I do shows and we talk about the thyroid a lot. It's one of the most popular things I get asked to, to speak on. And so there's people podcasting all over the place uh, for thyroid, but I don't really specialize. I, I, if I'm a specialist in anything, it's stress and the effects of stress. Um, and, uh, everything else is kind of downhill from there. Like what it does to the thyroid, what it does to the immune system, what it does to digestion, detoxification and on and on and on and on. So I, I think stress is where all, all illness begins. And so we look at the different types of stress, wanting to go back to your, your, your point about, you know, there's a thyroid receptor in every cell. Yeah. Tells you it's pretty important. <laughs> it, profound and with um so in back to the gut though i want you to get stay on this gut topic you um okay. so come, come back into that um so with looking at it like are you showing symptoms of um maldigestion i mean you know the microbiome is a huge study component um you know what are you seeing with you know you're saying 25 percent of our thyroid circulation is t3 um, how, how's the gut playing a role there? I mean, with dysbiosis, is there certain probiotics that people should be on? Um, how, what are the symptoms that somebody's looking for with that gut aspect? Well, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, well, the, if you just take maldigestion, malabsorption, that can lead to malnutrition. You have all kinds of health problems, but specifically you could have heartburn, gas, indigestion, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, alternating diarrhea, constipation, um, nausea, you know, goes on and on. You could have also the very poor breakdown of your uh, foods. So they break down in different ways. Uh, fats, what happens to fat as it's breaking down? If you leave butter out forever, you know, it goes rancid. So your fats go rancid. Um, that can produce organic acids and, and gas. Um, carbohydrates break down through a process of fermentation and, uh, and, and proteins putrefy. So you have what's called putrefaction, rancidification and, and fermentation all going on in an unhealthy gut. And so, yeah, that would be pretty instrumental in interfering with all kinds of processes like assimilation of foods. Um, the biosis versus dysbiosis, healthy, good flora, and thyroid conversion. That Remember, there's part of your T4 turns into these inactive forms, which are activated later, and that could make up 25% of your total T3. And so, so I, again, I have a kind of a hard time. I always am going upstream, upstream, upstream. I, I kind of live up in the, um, the behaviors and the markers we can use to form baselines that will just, and that's all they are to me. They're not a diagnosis. I don't give any medical diagnosis. Yep. Um, I look for healing opportunities. So that's the other thing you want to, you want to borrow a phrase, um, healing opportunities versus treatment options, you know, because diagnosis is like, well, what are the options here? What's the dosage? What's the frequency? So healing opportunities. It's a whole opens up a whole new world of, options for for behavior how are you going to get this to heal itself it's two different backyards and there's a fence between them there might even be a bridge over a, a ravine between them you know and i say we own the bridge you know so because i don't do medical anything medical yep it's all uh you know health and life coaching if you will yeah and, so and but we use the markers we use go ahead Okay, we so just you use the markers um, as I'll starting say, point. Let's tear down the let's tear down the walls. Let's tear down the the fences. Um, I like that healing opportunities component. Um, you know, speaking towards that, 
uh, it sounds like, so by taking this whole coaching component and wellness model with all of those opportunities, you're able to have the thyroid. So a lot of women in particular are put on thyroid and then they're basically told you're on this the rest of your life. So what, what do you think about that? Yeah. Uh, by when you get the kind of physician who's a shoulder shrugger and calls it an idiopathic condition, right. you might be on it for until you figure it out. And um, again, why is your thyroid hypoactive or why do you, maybe it's not even hypoactive. Again, we said it could be producing, but just not converting or it's converting into the wrong thing, or you get that, that sub uh, group of conversion. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with your thyroid, probably in 80% of the cases, unless you go into the Hashimoto's, that's a different ball game. And that does require some medical oversight because um, it can get worse from there. There can be a downward spiral where observations I make can't really be capitalized on. You got to get out of the woods first. And so, but then, then you're, you're in our backyard and we're going to lifestyle the hell out of it. You know, you're going to eat according to your metabolic type and fuel each and every cell just right. So, um, and then you're going to rest them and give your body a chance to detoxify. You're going to um, exercise and, and move things around, um, do some stimulation there. Stress reduction is huge. We look at food sensitivities. We didn't get there. And when you talk about gut dysfunction and thyroid, uh, especially Hashimoto's and stuff, uh, those those clients all have some kind of food sensitivities, especially around gluten, dairy, soy, corn, uh, the wheat, of course, you know, and um, so it, they're just more contributors to metabolic chaos that in a particular individual resulted in hibernation. Their body, nat you know, it's just under so much stress that it naturally slows down thyroid production. It doesn't want to burn up all your resources. And to me, I, I, I can't go, you know, I, I've just, I stay in my backyard, stay in my lane and I do a lot of good in the world that way. Cause we're, we're, we're the people that clients come to when they've tried everything else. Yeah. Especially all the medicine stuff. That's just not helping. I really appreciate. Yeah. The whole person uh, wellness component and the coaching uh, that you're, you've put forth and that you're training a lot of health coaches on um, in the last kind of closing couple minutes, any last parting words for our listeners read. Oh, is it time to go already? I th we were just getting warmed up. You know? I know, we're just getting um, going. And I'm not sure I answered all your questions because, again, we, I, I'm just trained because I, I get sort of pestered by all my – I have 3,000 students in 50 countries, and yeah. we're helping tens of thousands of people, and most of them aren't doctors. So I really have to watch the language. You know, like there's proprietary language that only physicians should use. Health coaches shouldn't use it, like diagnosis and treat. Sure. Bad words to use sure. if you're a health coach. We identify healing opportunities and make recommendations for lifestyle changes. Now, it's just as scientific. It's all science-based, evidence-based stuff. Um, but to answer your question, um, I was asked that question on an earlier interview today. And I just, this morning, was cleaning my desk. And I found something I wrote in 2018 when someone asked me. So probably almost three years ago, someone said, what are your top three tips read for, for the audience? You know, behind. And I just found this. And you know what? They haven't changed. They haven't changed in a long, long time. So I say get up every day and decide to be happy and tell yourself things are going to be good. You're going to have a good day. Maybe just a little better than yesterday, but just tell yourself that. Your point of view is so important. You know, if you see the world as a cup half full, you're more likely to live a happier life you know it's just I, I was born probably with more joy and enthusiasm a lot of people i don't know why but that's really my top top tip now it's right up there is to do something useful like you know if you get up and say oh it's going to be a great day i choose to be happy today you know it can become a habit it can actually have an effect you can become a more positive person you're more likely to be healthier and happier you'll do things like my number two is do something useful make your bed you know, uh, you know, obviously you're going to brush your teeth and 
wash your face or something, you know, but you could, you know, clean up a bit, take a walk, meditate, read something that's in the self-help area. Like I think reading self-help and I listen to tapes all the time. Still, I've been doing that for 40 years, you know, some really good old stuff, but get, get an old self-help book. Um, read something by James Allen, hmm. for instance, uh, right. probably written in the two centuries ago, but it's helpful. And then third thing is spend a couple hours a day or as much time as you can outside, maybe in bare feet. Of course, I'm in Southern California. That's easy to say, but, um, but you know, you want to get outside and get sunshine and fresh air and the stuff we were meant to have. I and mean, part of being uh, healthy is being in nature. I, I really firmly believe that. And as an environmentalist, you know, I spent a long time helping try to protect nature and protect the environment and stuff. So those are my three top things. Get up every day, decide okay. to be happy, do something useful and stay outside as much as you can. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Reed. Of course, I called my clinic Nature Cure, so I'm in full alignment with those three top threes there. Uh, everybody, this is What the Health. If you've enjoyed the show today, please share us with your loved ones. This is how we get the information out. We are here on the Contact Talk Radio Tuesdays from 2 to 3 Pacific Standard Time. See you next week.